Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Denise Leidy. I'm one of the curators in the Department of Asian Art, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to Shilla Korea's Golden Kingdom, an exhibition that opened on November 4th. For those of you that have already been to Shilla, please come back and bring all your friends. For those of you who haven't made it yet, we hope to whet your appetite this afternoon, and it's very, very easy to find. If you walk out of this auditorium and turn right, and just keep going past the Great Hall into the Greek and Roman Gallery, and you keep your eyes peeled to the right, you'll eventually see a video that will lead you to Shilla Korea's Golden Kingdom. Um, this exhibition actually began about five years ago, and for those of you that hang out at the Met, one of the inspirations was the exhibition Hidden Treasures of Afghanistan, which I co-curated with colleagues from the Department of Ancient Near Eastern Art, and when I was in Korea, talking about what a pleasure it is to work at the Met, because of the breadth of knowledge in my curatorial colleagues, I pointed out that collaboration can be very interesting and fun and can lead to imaginative answers. Um, that led to the offer of Shilla Korea's Golden Kingdom, which I co-curated with one of my colleagues from the Department of Asian Art, So Young Lee. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce you to all four speakers who will then do their thing without further information from me. So Young Lee, as I mentioned, is a colleague in the Department of Asian Art and is the co-curator of the Shilla exhibition. She has published widely on several aspects of Korean art and culture and is the curator here of several acclaimed exhibitions, including the recent uh, Poetry in Clay, Kun Chang, Korean Bunchang Ceramics. She will be followed by a guest speaker, Dr. Sarah Milridge Nelson, who is the John Evans Distinguished Professor Emerita, Emerita at the University of Denver. Dr. Nelson has published widely and has received several awards. Relevant publications for this presentation are The Archaeology of Korea, Korean Social Archaeology, the Archaeology of Northeast China, and Shamanism and the Origin of the State. She has also published an article on Gall Crowns of Shilla, and in addition writes novels that take place in Korea and China. Dr. Nelson will be followed by another member of the home team, Donna Strahan, who is the, a conservator in our Department of Objects Conservation, Donna and her colleagues are responsible for maintaining and studying the vast collections in this institution. Donna's specialty is Chinese decorative, or I should say three-dimensional objects from Asia, and she's published on lacquer and metalworking. She is also the co-author with me of a relatively recent publication entitled Wisdom and Body, Chinese Taoist and Buddhist Sculpture at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And towards the end of her presentation, Donna will be joined by Jenna Wainwright. Now, Jenna is the star of one of the videos that's on view in Shilla Korea's Golden Kingdoms. And while you may not recognize her face, you should recognize her beautiful hands. Um, she's also a jewelry designer. And I don't know if you can see them, but she's responsible for my Korean-inspired earrings that she's wearing right now. And she's a conservation preparator in the building. Donna, Jenna and her colleagues are some of the hidden heroes of exhibitions and presentations at the Met. And as you walk through and you see how things are beautifully shown, carefully pinned up, almost hidden in the way that they're um, attached and made safe, you can recognize the handiwork of Jenna and her colleagues. Again, please visit Shilla Korean's Golden Kingdom often and join me in welcoming our four speakers this morning, or this afternoon. Thank you very much. And Ms. Soyoung Lee is coming up to the stage. together. Good afternoon. Sorry, I thought we were still in morning. <laughs> Thank you, Denise, for the introductions. My name is So Young Lee, and I'm going to just 
do a very brief run through of the highlights of the exhibition to kind of situate you within the kingdom of Schiller and will be followed by other lectures and demonstrations as Denise pointed out. Um, the t-shirt, I'm very much in Schiller mode today, the t-shirt I'm wearing is <laughs> actually from the Schiller shop and this actually the design is adapted from uh, the floor tiles, for those of you who've already seen the exhibition, that connect the second and third sections of the exhibition and come from one of the major architectural um, structures in the ca ancient capital city, city of Gyeongju. So jumping right in, wanted to just briefly situate us. Um, I think I do have a pointer. Korea, the kingdom of Shilla, with uh, the capital city of Gyeongju in the southeastern corner of today's Korea, still great remnants of the uh, luxuries of, of the Shilla kingdom remaining and very visible in the capital city of Gyeongju. But to place Korea within the context of the broader Eurasia, that it is not connected only to the continent, the Chinese kingdoms and cultures, but through trade and other means along the Silk Road, the Northern Steppes and the maritime trade route. The map on the left shows Schiller roughly around the second half or the end of the fourth century when it begins to ascend uh, in distinction. But you can see that it's really only one of four states with the northern state above it being actually the, having the greatest power during this time. So Schiller really was a small state, one among several on the Korean peninsula in the fourth century when it begins to rise. And by the seventh century has unified most of the states, certainly the, all of the three other kingdoms or states um, with a new northern kingdom taking place later on. So this is the story of Schiller that we're telling in the exhibition from about 400 to 800 and highlighting the gold culture, what we call the gold culture of Schiller kingdom. This is the cap ancient capital city of Gyeongju, today probably the second uh, most visited tourist spot in South Korea next to Seoul and an amazing small city, an aerial view that shows you the visible markers, the visual markers, the monuments, the mounded tombs of the royals and the elites, from which the many golden and other treasures in the exhibition uh, come, and which really kind of held the secrets of the Shilla kingdom until about the 20th century. These t tombs are, are practically impenetrable and have been not looted and not excavated until really much of the 20th century. And the so I'm just going to go back for a second. The double mound in the center here, the largest one, is this, known as the Great Tomb of Hwangnam, a double burial of a king and a queen dating to about the fifth century. And this tomb is the, the scene that you see in the first room as you enter the Silla exhibition, uh, transporting you literally to Gyeongju as if you're walking by the tomb. This double burial measures about 290 feet in diameter and over 400 feet in total length north-south, combining both burials. And this forms kind of the centerpiece of the first part of the exhibition, which highlights all of the treasures, the major treasures from the Korean tombs, from Silla tombs from the 5th and 6th centuries. And by the way, I should point out that there are no contemporaneous Korean written sources or histories of this period, either of Silla or the other states. Um, the written comprehensive history of so-called three kingdoms of Korea doesn't occur until much later in the 12th century. There are contemporaneous Chinese sources, slightly later Japanese sources, but in other words, it's archaeology and the excavation of these wonderful, mysterious tombs that have really shaped our understanding and narratives of Shilla Kingdom from the 5th and 6th centuries. So the first thing that greet you, really forming the centerpiece of the first section, is the crown and belt. And Dr. Nelson will be speaking at greater length about the crowns from the Shilla Kingdom. 
but gold crown and belt that was discovered not from the king's tomb, who was the actual monarch, but his queen. The king only had silver and gilt bronze crowns and headdresses, so all of our assumptions about gold being the most precious, the most important precious metal, and what it might symbolize, is sort of turned on its head in terms of the discovery of the gold crown with the queen. Um, but it very much the set of the crown and the belt highlight Schiller's nomadic connections. Uh, um, Schiller was very much part of the horse riding cultures that spread all through the northern Eurasian steppes, probably transmitted to Schiller through the northern kingdom of, of Koguryo. And you'll notice also with the crown, the numerous comma-shaped jade ornaments that dangle from the top part of the a crown. And one of the questions that Denise and I most asked with this exhibition is, what exactly are those and what does it mean? And there's no definitive answer. And based on the context, we surmise potentially, given the embryonic shape, perhaps symbolizing life and uh, also symbolizing political authority. But Truthfully, you can see what you want in it because there's no, <laughs> there's no inscription to tell us exactly what it is. Some Korean scholars like to see dragons. Other visitors have told me, hey, that looks like a cashew. So. <laughs> but they are ubiquitous. And as far as we know, uh, only present in, during this time around 5th, 6th century in Korea and Japan. Another type of head ornament, headdress ornament to kind of highlight the shimmering um, decorative effect of these gold headdresses. This would have been inserted into a conical cap that was worn on top of a, a male's hat. You see the winged shape. And it really, the way that it's designed, it flutters. It's not a stable, it's very delicate object, and it flutters. And you can imagine the visual impact if the person were wearing this, like butterfly wings fluttering, and the gazillion tiny gold uh, circular elements shimmering in the light. Golden accessories, personal adornments, jewelry, necklaces, earrings, uh, bracelets and rings. So many of them have been found in almost all of the Shilla tombs dating to the fifth and sixth centuries. The great tomb of Hwangnam had thousands and thousands, not only of gold regalia and jewelry, but pottery, uh, precious metal vessels, horse fittings, weapons, armor. So the Shilla people truly believed in the afterlife, that, that death was not the end point. In fact, it marked a beginning of another life. And particularly the royals and elites were buried with all of the necessities and luxuries uh, needed to sustain them through the long afterlife. And some of these are incredibly exquisite and uh, we will have Jenna show you some of the techniques that were used in Shilla goldsmithing or gold making. Earrings, by the way, were worn, appeared to have been worn by both genders and cut to a certain extent across uh, rank as well. So in addition to gold and precious objects, also pottery, Korea during this time, Schiller in particular in the 5th and 6th centuries, was, had possessed one of the most sophisticated technology of producing high-fired stoneware, um, probably second only to China. And these are some of the quintessential Schiller ceramics with their tall stands with perforated bases. When you see that, you know it's Schiller. So in addition to huge quantities of gold and other precious materials made within Shilla. The intriguing thing about Shilla tombs from this period is that there are objects, coveted luxury exotic items that were clearly made outside of Korea, sometimes as far away as near the Mediterranean, along the uh, steppes, along the Silk Road, and in Central Asia and made their way to Korea and preserved in these tombs. And among them are Roman-style uh, glass vessels, which of course during this period and much earlier were coveted by many cultures along the Silk Road. And Korea happened to be, Shilla happened to be participating in that sort of exchange. The, um, 
You were shaped, beautiful vessel here, unfortunately it's too fragile to travel, but this is one of the uh, glass vessels that were discovered in the great tomb of Huangnam. This particular marbled piece, perhaps produced somewhere in today's Afghanistan, the blue glass may very well have been made in closer, either in China or potentially even in Shilla. So just to remind you again, that Shilla was very much a part of the Silk Road that connected the West and East. It did not end in Chang'an of Tang Dyna, which of course was um, one of the great sort of empires of that period, but that it connected all the way to Kyungju as well. And I'd like to call your attention to this region between the Black Sea and Central Asia, which is where we believe this stunning gold um, dagger and sheath, probably a decorative item, was made. It is unique among extant objects. There is nothing else like it, or if there is, we don't know about it. So if you know of anything, please let us know. <laughs> um, and the closest example is a fragment, which is the bottom right, that was found somewhere in Kazakhstan and today is preserved at the, the Hermitage. But it really is just the fragment. The dagger and sheath, in terms of shape, we know is a Central Asian shape because there are uh, tomb wall paintings and such that show Central Asians with daggers in this shape. The technique is a, a gold strip it's inlaid, as you can see here, with garnet and glass. That was a popular form of cloisonné, uh, popularized in the Byzantium world. So hence uh, the conjecture that it was made somewhere between the Black Sea and Central Asia. And in fact, if you have a moment in our very own European medieval galleries, there are examples, much smaller items, including um, brooches and, and other uh, jewelry that use the same technique, including in some cases the granulation. Uh, that were made around the same period in today's France, Ger uh, East Germany, and so forth. So, so clearly this was something that, a technique that stretched from uh, Eastern Europe all the way through the to, the, to Central Asia, to the Black Sea region, and somehow some of these objects traveled all the way to the Shilla Kingdom. There is some debate about exactly how that may happen. So in other words, the person with whom this was buried, was he actually Korean? And how did this reach him? Could he have been Central Asian and traveled with the object to Korea, lived there, and was buried there? Some scholars believed objects, luxury objects like these, were in fact exchanged somewhere in Central Asia, which, I'm sorry, Central China, which was one of the great meeting points of East and West, where a lot of trade and exchange occurred. So there's still debate going on, and we, one of the things we wanted to do with the exhibition was to highlight some of the objects that are uh, extraordinary in terms of its implications for Eurasian history that only have been known in Korea, and we'd like to bring greater attention to them as well, and Shilla's position within that exchange. In addition to uh, imported objects, uh, the section that we call internationalism in Shilla, the second part of the exhibition, also highlights um, objects or imagery that are foreign. So objects made in Korea but celebrate foreign imagery. For example, the gentleman figurine, clay figurine, oh so big, which uh, was buried along with other figurines in certain tombs, now we're going, moving forward into seventh and eighth centuries, is clearly not a Korean gentleman. His facial features, large bulging eyes, big prominent nose and facial hair indicate that he is of perhaps West Asian origins. And he's not the only uh, foreign figure that are depicted in tomb art in Korea during this time. There are in fact, um, including, large-scale, over six feet tall stone figures of similarly um, featured West Asians that guard tombs of, of Shilla kings from the 7th, 8th, and 9th centuries. So a very intriguing phenomenon. They may very well have traveled to Korea, either worked there or as visitors, or it's in, at the very least we know that Koreans who traveled to Tang, China, and elsewhere would have come into contact with them. In contrast, the lovely lady on the right-hand side is very much Korean. She's dubbed the shy lady because of her, um, you know, covering, sorry, the left hand covering her mouth as she smiles. 
Now, one of the most um, astounding cultural phenomena in Korea during this time, and particularly Shilla, is the arrival and adoption of Buddhism. Buddhism, of course, a foreign religion that started in India and entered probably Shilla perhaps as early as the fourth century, but officially adopted as the state religion around 527 and completely changes the society and culture. And it's one of the things that we highlight in the exhibition because it is an important part of the Shilla history. So it completely changes people's perception of death or idea of death and the afterlife. No longer do they believe in um, a continued life of, of, of afterlife, sorry, after death, and no longer is there any need to bury the deceased with all of the essentials and luxuries to continue them in the afterlife. Most people are cremated, as is the typical Buddhist tradition, and the tombs get smaller because there's just no need for these large mounded tombs. And in terms, in vi visual terms as well, the material gold, which dominates the first two sections of the exhibition, which really was such a, a big part of the Shilla life and afterlife in terms of gold personal adornments. That material now shifts to make, to be used to make uh, religious icons and reliquaries, like this emblematic figure from the late 6th, early 7th century, known as the pensive bodhisattva. It is about three feet tall, almost life-size figure of a, a young boy in meditation. It's perhaps sort of the Mona Lisa of Korean art, not just Shilla art. It's one of the, the most famous images of Korean art. It was last in New York in 1981 as part of a great, a great exhibition, 5,000 years of Korean art, so it's visiting New York some 30 odd years later. Maybe the last time you'll see it here, so enjoy it. Korea has very strict rules about permitting so-called designated national treasures out of the country. It was quite a drama to get him here. Um, but he's very much part of the Pan-Asian phenomenon of Buddhist art and uh, religion that sweeps through the Korean peninsula and takes over Shilla. And in adopting the religion as a state religion, Shilla essentially becomes an integral part of that broader Pan-Asian world. Just some details of the back and the way we have presented him in the exhibition is meant to encourage you to really engage with him at close range and walk all around him and admire his beauty. So gold is usually in Buddhist, um, Buddhist art used a, as a gilding on top of cast bronze statues or reliquaries, but there are few examples like this diminutive Buddha about so high, very photogenic, uh, which, who is in fact pure gold. Uh, and so uh, an amazing example of the transition in the use of the material of gold. He dates to slightly later in the 8th century when Buddhism has really taken root in Shilla and also reflects what we call the international style of Buddhism that sweeps through all of, East, all of Asia, particularly highlighted in Tang, China at this time with the fleshier face and body, more sensuous form that is embodied perhaps best in this cast iron Buddha, perhaps the earliest extant iron Buddha anywhere that dates to late 8th or 9th century. It's a colossal, impressive statue, uh, not only for its uh, physical quality of the iron, but it really embodies the, both the uh, spirituality of Buddhism and the Pan-Asian context of that religion during this period. And in the exhibition itself, I hope you'll note that he's in fact a descendant of the Buddha that is shown in the video of the famous monument, Sokuram, that precedes the statue in the context of the exhibition. And he is indeed also the grand finale of the show. So I thank you for joining me this afternoon, and I'd like to introduce and welcome Dr. Sarah Nelson, who will talk more in detail about those intriguing gold crowns from Shilla. Thank you.
Well, hello and welcome. I'm um, a, a Kore Korean archaeologist and thrilled to death that this exhibit is here. So I hope you all do get a chance to see it and maybe over and over because you can't really take it all in on the first round. Um, I want to talk especially about the queen's tomb of those big mounds because I think there's a different puzzle. Uh, Soyoung told you that possibly the meaning of gold is different and I think maybe the meaning of the tombs is different. So I will explain this in some detail as to why I think it's a mystery that's worth considering. So this is the very most elaborate and gorgeous of the tombs in the Shilla period. And it's um, the first one as far as archaeologists know. We don't have very good dating um, ability for the Shilla tombs. There's not much there for most of them for radiocarbon dating. There are very few inscriptions and so forth. So we're left looking at artifacts in order to seriate the tombs, in order to say which ones are older and which ones are younger. But this seems to be, this very biggest tomb with the very most beautiful crown, seems to be one of the first of the mounded tombs. And that is her elaborate crown. Uh, so here's the mystery of the ruling queen. Um, there are ruling queens in the Shilla histories. Uh, they're later in time, and there's no ruling queen of this time that's mentioned in the, as Soyoung told you, much later histories written down in the 11th, 12th centuries um, that are, uh, but these, these queens are named, they're known as rulers. They're called by a word that literally could be translated as female kings but not at this time. So these female kings um, existed. They were possible that people did in some of the writings, some people complained about them, but not for being women, but for things that they actually did uh, that these writers disapproved of. But in any case, it, it was okay to be a female king. Um, so there aren't any ruling kings, queens, in, at this time, or this early in Shilla. But the woman in the North Mound had all the regalia of kingship, of rulership, and the gold crown and the gold belt. So while Soyoung told you the mystery was maybe that we didn't, that gold wasn't what we thought it is, I'm suggesting that maybe rulership wasn't what we thought it was. You've already seen pictures of the Korean Peninsula, and here's Shilla in the lower right corner, just to remind you. And hmm, there we are. And a little closer up. And one thing you'll notice about where Kyongju is in the lower right-hand corner, I don't know if I can even point it out, but around in here, um, is that it's not on a major river, it's not a port, it's an odd place for a, a place that became so famous that uh, conquered the rest of the lower Korean peninsula. And how did that happen? How, what was its power? And there is no absolute, uh, I can't say what that uh, power was for sure, um, but they had gold. And it may be that the gold is somehow related to that power. Earlier, they also had iron, which was also very important. So just to put this in the um, context of the whole of Korean prehistory, there was what was called bumun, a kind of a very plain pottery that's late Neolithic to Bronze Age, uh, that is 1300 to 100 BC. Then there's what we call the proto Three Kingdoms period, where according to the histories, the Three Kingdoms were already present, but archeologists don't see them as state level societies yet. And so we call it proto Three Kingdoms, 100 BC to 300 AD. And then 
the three kingdoms themselves up to 668 when Shilla, with the help of Tang China, conquered the rest of the kingdoms and put them right out of business. And from that time on, we call it United Shilla, but it lasts until 935 AD, which means that the city of Kyungju was the capital of an entity for almost a thousand years. Um, here is a fortress that is probably very old. Again, radiocarbon dates are hard to come by, but it probably dates to very early in Shilla times. I don't know if you can see that that's right on the small river, but it is a river. Uh, this is the outline of it. And in the, this is an old picture from the 1930s, and back here are those giant tombs. Um, so they were there then. The first time I saw the giant tombs, um, this is how they look now, but the first time I saw them, they were covered with trees, and they even had little streets along them and houses. So they were being treated as natural hills. That's how big this is, just to give you a sense of the hugeness of this particular mound. That's the double mound, and here is a picture of it. The, um, you can't go in that mound anymore. It's been all put back, although it was uh, excavated. But there is one, if you, when you go to Gyeongju, you must go, now that you've seen the ex exhibit. Uh, but that one, you can go inside and see the beautiful things that were in the flying horse tomb. Oops. Um, it was already mentioned that Shilla tombs were very hard to rob, and so this is an uh, archaeologist's version of why they're hard to rob. They were built at ground level, which you might think would be make it easy to rob, but no, a giant mound of stones went over it, and then a giant mound of earth on top of that. And you can imagine being a tomb robber and trying to tunnel into that, uh, it would be a difficult job to get it all done in one night. It would have been an impossible job. So whereas the other kingdoms of Korea had tombs that were entered by a long tunnel, it was very easy to rob those. We know so much less about those kingdoms than we know about Chilla because of that. So we should be very thankful to the very clever Chilla people for making mounds of this kind. Um, this is a view of the king's tomb, actually not the queen's. Um, the south mound was the king's tomb, but after everything had been taken out. But you can get a good sense of those huge stones uh, that were placed over the tomb. So this is my notion of what's the puzzle of the uh, north mound of tomb 98, the Huang Nam Te Chong. It's a double mound of the general Korean consensus is that it's early 5th century. There are things in it that suggest to me that we could consider at least that it's late 4th century. There's, for example, um, a, a pot, um, a Chinese pot that is dated from the late 4th century in one of them. So there are reasons to suppose it at least could be that early. Um, double mounds in Chilla are always a man and a woman and presumably their husband and wife. So that when they excavated, they expected to find a male tomb and a female tomb. And indeed, that's what they found. I should add that bodies are not found usually ever in, in Chilla tombs uh, because the, the the, the atmosphere is not conducive to saving bodies. So there was one tooth of the, in the male tomb. And the reason we're sure that the other one is a female tomb is it actually had an inscription, also very rare in Shilla tombs. And the inscription said, belt for my lady. So we're pretty sure that that was the female tomb. Um, the male tomb had huge amounts of weaponry. It was just amazing, incredible. So clearly he had something to do with armies, with conquest, and at that time Schiller was busy uh, conquering all the other little Kaya towns that were nearby. 
whereas the south tomb, the female burial, has the gold crown and the belt that was almost, uh, almost 10 pounds worth of gold jewelry. And so this is of gold altogether. So it was pretty amazing amount of gold in there. Um, so as I've said before, ruling queens were recorded in Shiloh, but not at the time of this tomb. So who is she? Um, I can't answer that question really, although if you were interested in all the details of the early kings and queens, I could tell you what I think, but that's not relevant for this. Um, so the, this queen, I think, was a ruling queen. Another thing about that makes me think she was a ruling queen is that she lived 30 years or so after her husband. We know this from the artifacts in the tomb. So she was there, and she was probably the boss. <laughs> Here's her royal gold belt. Uh, the belts, again, she had the gold belt, he didn't. Um, it has all kinds of symbolism. We don't, can't say exactly what it is, but it's quite intriguing. Um, there are historical records about the Shilla elite that allow us to talk about um, the various ranks. It was, there were sumptuary laws, which means that the laws that said only the highest rank can wear gold. And the next rank had rules and rules and rules all down for uh, six different ranks, um, which uh, were very interesting. They were very detailed, uh, uh, detailed about what your horse could look like, the saddle, could be made of, what, the, um, what your boots could be made of, and the second rank down couldn't wear wrinkled purple leather reindeer boots. I'm sure that was a big hardship for them in any case. Um, so the, the, we know from that, uh, although that document is later than the time period of this show, we, we know that Shilla had ranks, and they were called bone ranks because the Shilla sense of um, kinship was based in bone rather than we talk about blood, and they talked about bone, whose, whose bones were related to who else's bones. So the, old, the highest was called the holy bone, and only the holy bone could rule. And under that was the true bone, and the true bone could be the nobility. Um, so there were very strict rules about um, not getting out of your rank. And you can, in, in the, although the, the histories were written much later, in the histories you can see uh, who everybody was, how, they were, how the kings and queens were related to each other. It, doesn't tell you everything you want to know, but you could look at the matrilineal line as well as the patrilineal lines, the way they were late, related through their mothers as well as their fathers, because it's written in the uh, histories. And so we, we can look at that, and what we find out is that at the time of this queen in this uh, particular bound, um, the queen's daughters were the next queens. So you can think of that, maybe, as the, the rulership was passing down through females. The kings that married these queen's daughters were not necessarily even related to each other. They belonged to different families. Um, so kings' sons did not necessarily become kings before King Michu Gu is the, the first of the Kim kings. And therefore, there is another reason to suppose that it was important uh, who your female ancestors were. After that, after the times of these great huge tombs, uh, king's sons did become the kings, and it became very patrilineal. Oops. Hmm. Well, now what am I doing wrong? There we go. Um, I already said this. <laughs> All right. Oh, no, I didn't. Okay. Um, 
So the king in the South Mound was clearly a warrior who had this excess of weaponry. And the king, the queen, didn't have a lot of weaponry, but she did have a dagger and all the regalia of rulership. And as you've already heard, both tombs had many things that came from very far away and were very precious and uh, suggest that they had um, come through some Silk Road or another. Some of them may even have come by ship. There's a, uh, a bead in particular that was only made in Indonesia. That's very intriguing. So here are some of the beads. Eventually, glass was made in Korea, uh, but this may be all imported glass. Um, Okay, the sumptuary rules again, everybody rode horses, so it was necessary to tell people how many horses they could have and what their saddles could look like, what their saddles could be made out of, and how far they could uh, push their ability to uh, look like they were more important than they were. They were not allowed to do that. The rules were divided by gender, so there are rules for men and rules for women, but they're not, um, they're, they are equivalent. So that the, in each rank, the women's restrictions were very similar to the men's restrictions. It was only that the restrictions, when they pertain to clothes, had to talk about different things. The lowest rank of females, for example, for reasons I cannot possibly explain, were not allowed to wear petticoats. Um, so, but there, it's really fun to read because it gives you a sense of the things that are perishable and that we don't find uh, in, archaeologically in the tombs. Um, furthermore, uh, the Sumptuary rules suggest, and so do um, other things that are found in the tombs, that they're related to the steps. Um, there's reindeer symbolism, as I'll show you on the, on the crowns. There's birch bark. Birch doesn't grow in southern Korea. Um, there are geometric designs and, and uh, white horses, which were worshipped in the steps. So there are a lot of reasons to suppose that the ancestors of the Shilla people uh, came from the steps, were related to the people of the steps, and so forth. Um, but this is a different kind of relationship. This is one of the queen's necklaces, and the shape uh, in the square diamond shape with the jewel in the middle, it was also in a ring. A ring has been found that's just like that at one of the shrines that honor the sea goddesses that are found in Japan. And the, the, otherwise, this isn't as far as I've ever seen found in Japan. And therefore, we can assume that it relates uh, to some wish for a pleasant voyage, that uh, the sea goddesses were responsible for keeping the seas calm. and. People gave things at their shrine, and one of the things was a ring, just like these, uh, that uh, presumably came from Shilla. Okay, the gold crowns. Um, it's interesting to me that the gold crowns that have been found throughout the steps are uh, either exclusively found on female heads or nearly so. Uh, so the gold crowns somehow belong to women in this large step culture. Um, and again, in the Shilla culture, gold belonged. Gold crowns could only be worn uh, by people who were holy bone. Um, there's shamanic symbolism in the gold crowns um, that connect the um, the whole idea of Shilla to the steps, and I'll show you some pictures and you could decide if you agree with me or not. Um, but they seem to be from another kind of, of culture. 
And I'm particularly interested in the side pendants of the crowns, um, and um, as well as, and I'm, I'll show you some in a minute, as well as the people have said that the uprights of the Shilla crowns represent the tree of life, which is also a kind of an idea of the steppe people, and the curved jewel, the gokok, uh, is related to the steppes probably as well. So here's one of those gold crowns, but I especially want you to look at those things that fall down from the, the, the circle that goes around the head, the things that stick up, and you can see that some look like antlers and some might be the tree of life, and the other things that hang down the sides. So this doesn't have any hanging things down the sides, but this is the crown from Afghanistan that's quite astonishingly like Shilla crowns. All those dangling gold things and the very fact that there's a circlet and things standing up also make it look shamanic. This one doesn't have any good provenience. It's said to be Kogorio uh, and has things that uh, dangle down the sides. Kogorio was another of the three kingdoms. And then I found all these nice pictures of people um, with step headdresses or crowns that were found archeologically both uh, with things that dangle down over the ears, over the sides, just like Shilla crowns. So the one on the right is modern, the one on the left is archeological and is made of gold as well. Otherwise, they're not similar to the uh, Shilla crowns, but they are with the dangly things. Here's another modern one with things dangling over the ears. Um, so the, there's, that's just one of the reasons for supposing that there's some relationship between Shilla and the people all the way across the steppe region of the north. And this is just another example of the things from far away, but this one comes from as far away as the first crown I showed you. Um, it's a silver bowl that was in the, I believe in the south mound in the man's tomb of tomb 98. Um, but that particular style is uh, from the western side of the steps. So to sort of sum up, the holy bone rank of the Shilla um, probably moved into the Korean peninsula around 300 AD. Uh, they had iron, they got famous and rich off their iron trade. At that time, the Han Dynasty of, uh, at that time there was a, um, an embargo on anybody owning a monopoly, I guess is the word I'm looking for, of of iron and salt, and iron was found in the Korean Peninsula, and there's huge amounts of trade in iron. It's probably the original source of the uh, Shilla's prosperity. Um, but in any case, they also, people in the steppes make big mounded tombs, and here comes the people that begin to make big mounded tombs, uh, create iron, and so forth. And their beliefs seem to be shamanic, like the people of the steppes. In the steppes and in Korea even today, women are more likely to be shamans than men are. And so it is not unreasonable to suppose that that queen with the beautiful crown, with the shamanic symbols, uh, was herself expected to be a shaman and perhaps help protect the kingdom uh, by means of her shamanic powers. Um, so in uh, Shilla, either a woman or a man could be chosen to rule, uh, or there could have been, for all we know, co-rulership as there was in Japan of an emperor and an empress who were both rulers, a brother and sister who were both rulers, a husband and wife who were both rulers. So there's no reason not to interpret the woman with the golden crown as a ruler, um, although we still don't really know the answer. Thank you very much. And next you'll hear from Donna Strawn. <laughs> 
Thank you, Sarah. It's, it's really very interesting. Uh, I think your presentation leads very nicely into what I'm going to show you next. When we're talking about the influence of the uh, northern nomads, I'm going to show that there are also parallels in the technology in the Shilla jewelry in the exhibit throughout the ancient world. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what is gold, where does it come from, and how has it worked. And then we'll look at a few techniques. And finally, Jenna will be giving a demonstration on those techniques. So uh, I should say that most of the objects I'm going to be showing you are belong to the, <coughs> excuse me, the Metropolitan, and you should run around the museum and look for them. But especially, you should go into the Schiller exhibition again and take another look, because I hope I can show you some interesting information about the objects. We'll never know when the first gold was discovered. It's, it's too soft a material to be used for tools or weapons like stone or copper, but it's ideally suited to be used for display, and it also has a, a ability to withstand any corrosion, so it always stays bright and shiny. Therefore, it makes it a fine symbol for wealth and is found in elite burials very early on. The earliest gold is actually the burials at Varna in Bulgaria, and the necklace on the left is an example of one of the early gold pieces found there, and that's roughly 4,000 BC. Small ornaments were also sewn onto the clothing in those burials. And similar objects have been found in the Indus civilizations, and also in ancient Mesopotamia. At the city of Ur, now in present-day Iraq, the buried gold treasures there are extensive. And then, of course, in Egypt, you, I'm sure, are familiar with the gold pectorals, among many other gold items found in burials. In ancient Greece, the poet Homer talks about gold as a wealth among mortals but it's also a symbol of omnipotence among the immortals. Oddly enough, in China, it wasn't until around 700 BC that gold was really used at all in any of the burials, and it never really replaced the importance of jade and bronze. So what is gold? It's one of the, it is the most noble metal, which means that it is resistant to oxidation and corrosion and it has some very unique properties. The color, of course, bright and beautiful and shiny. It's very, very dense, extremely heavy. It's very malleable, easy to work and form. It has good electrical conductivity and also good thermal conductivity. There are two main types of gold. There's alluvial gold, or also known as placer deposits, and vein gold, or load gold. They're both closely related to quartz. Alluvial gold is found with the detritus of gravel and sands from the disintegration of gold-rich rocks. They are made from metallic ores that have, because it's metallic ore, it's very resistant to any kind of weathering so that temperature changes and expansion and contraction of freezing water or wind and, uh, again, water erosion can wash away the rocks, but they really don't harm the gold. Instead, what happens is the minerals around the gold, as you can see the, down the bottom two slides, the gold veins, um, the minerals around them wash away and free the gold, which then is also washed as well. And it can be washed down out of the mountains, down into the rivers, and can be found quite far away from the original parent rock. With the vein gold, it's uh, always associated with quartz, as you see here, and it's also found uh, up in the mountains, but it has to be mined. And you can see these sort of irregular masses inside both of these uh, rocks. And up in the left, where the alluvial gold is, you can see the, the range of size and shape of the types of nuggets. So in order to collect the gold, it's usually done by panning. You people gather sand and gravel 
uh, along with water in shallow basins and wash out the, the rocky matter sort of floats off and the heavier gold collects at the bottom of the pan, as you can see here. And this has been done since ancient times and is even done today. Now, you may be familiar with the legend of King Midas of Lydia. And they think perhaps that that story might have uh, become a fanciful explanation as to why the river Patoclus was so full of gold. Greedy Midas foolishly wished that all he touched would turn to gold. Of course, that was until he tried to eat his dinner. He was then told by the gods, okay, if you wash, take a bath in this river, this will cure you, in which it did. And therefore, this is the reason that there's so much gold in that particular river. Well, you can also then collect gold in a sluice, which is a long trough with cleats along the bottom to catch the gold. The sand and gravel is shoveled into the sluice and water flows along. And again, the heavier gold collects in the crevices. And up on the right, you can see a 16th century example of a sluice being used. And down on the left, a 19th century. And over on the right, modern day in, I think it may be either California or South Dakota. Stories of gold-rich rivers probably prompted the Greek legend of Jason and the Argonauts and their quest for the Golden Fleece. It was somewhere in the land to the east. And you, there's a Greek uh, vessel up on the left. He's holding a, a golden fleece. The fleece of the sheep is a perfect filter for collecting the fine particles of gold. So the Greek historian Strabo wrote that there was a country far to the east where after the winter heavy rains brought down gold, which the locals would then collect in troughs, pierced with holes and lined with fleeces. And in fact, it is up until recent times in the country of Georgia, where they were uh, using sh the fleece of a sheep to collect the gold. And, and once it was dried, they'd hang it up and then they'd shake out or comb out the gold particles. Now there's also hydraulic mining, which really doesn't come into use until around the Roman period, but essentially they're using long, uh, strong currents of water directed against the gold-bearing earth and washing out all of the minerals along with the gold particles. In fact, mining of gold vein deposits was similar to shaft or pit mining in which you do for other metals. However, gold ores are extremely hard and abrasive, and thus the extraction requires a great deal of effort. In antiquity, they probably built fires next to the deposit and then threw cold water on it to break up the rocks. And then once they had these broken up rocks, they then had to pound those further to make smaller pieces and then literally pulverize them further as well and then take them over using water again and wash out the minerals and leave the gold behind. So keep in mind that none of this mining can be done without water. So if you don't have any water near, then you're not gonna have any mines. We really do believe that most of the gold in antiquity was probably alluvial gold because dealing with the deposits in veins would not have been very profitable. Uh, but then the question comes up, where does the gold from Scylla come from? We don't know. There are no ancient mines have been located at this point, and it's very possible that they've been mined out as so many other places in the world. Now that we've extracted the gold, what do we have? Most native or natural gold contains some silver, usually between five to 30%. It also contains copper, but rarely greater than about 2%. So the amount of silver and copper in the gold can alter its properties. Changing its color, as you can see here in this chart, or making it harder, or changing the melting temperature. These Shilla earrings were analyzed and contain about 80% gold, 19% silver, and less than half a percent copper. They were probably made from alluvial gold. Multicolored effects and inlays of different alloys and materials were popular in antiquity, as was the manipulation of the color of gold by alloying. Attractive shades can be produced by adding, say, copper or silver 
to your gold. And if you add copper, you tend to get more of a pinkish tone, as you can see on the right of this chart. And if you add more silver, you get more of a greenish uh, or whitish tinge. A goldsmith's workshop leaves very little evidence in the archaeological record. Gold is far too valuable to be left lying around as waste. And discarded crucibles and molds may retain traces of these precious materials, which can be detected by scientific analysis. But usually the tools that the goldsmith has been using are very similar to tools used by other crafts. So you can't be sure that they were goldsmith tools. And the tools have changed very little over time. You essentially have a wooden bench, um, a source of heating for melting or soldering, as well as hammers and anvils. Oops, I don't want to go quite there. And you've got chisels and snips and shears that can be used for cutting and stamping and vices for holding. And of course, casting requires small crucibles and tongs. Some historical handbooks on metallurgy uh, techniques have been handed down, but they're not the original composition, compositions and they're often very confusing. So we really only have the gold objects themselves to try and understand the techniques of the goldsmiths. We know that jewelry was first used uh, with gold as a personal adornment, and even today is central to the manufacture of jewelry, signifying wealth and status and beauty. It uh, keeps its value during economic downturns, and in fact, what often happens is much of it is melted down, regardless of how artistically beautiful it was. Early jewelry escaped recycling because it was buried. And these burials are what give us a clear picture of how and where it was worn on the body. And the Shilla burials not only provide this information for us, but they also give us an idea of the technology of how the gold was made. So once you've collected your gold, the next thing you need to do is to combine it into larger pieces. And that's done by melting and forming it into an ingot, or you could cast it into a finished object at that point. And once you have your ingot, you can start hammering it. It's large enough to start hammering to form something. And using the cast ingot, the smith can make a variety of forms from thin gold sheet to wire to a bowl to a ring. Uh, a cup, for example, can be made from a flat disc by holding it against a stake, as you see here, is being done with a piece of copper, and then hammering it to force the metal progressively into the form of a shallow, hollow container. And there are some of the tools down on the bottom. The hammers, uh, a range of modern hammers today, and these are stakes like this that he's hammering against. And this is a pot of bitumen in which the metal, whatever you're going to use, you can hammer into you doing the repousé technique. And here's some examples in the Schiele exhibition of hammered objects. Although, aside from hammering uh, the crown on the right, you can see that they use chisels to actually do all the elaborate cutout in the gold. And hammering is actually the most consuming technique of all the techniques I'm going to show you today. These techniques were used throughout the ancient world, and here's a painting of a medieval workshop. And you can see they're using the same exact tools. You've got the stake, the hammers, and here's the bitumen, which he's doing some engraving on a piece of metal. And here's some examples of hammered gold work in the ancient world, um, I think all of which are on view in the museum right now. You've got examples from Mesopotamia, the Cypriot, the Egyptian gold sandals, the, and a little bit more um, elaborate Iranian gold vessel, and most elaborate at all, this Persian uh, gold riton, or drinking vessel. Now let's look at some wire techniques. Once you've got the 
gold sheet, you can cut strips. And here we've got the gold sheet and cutting a strip off of it. And then you can take those strips and by twisting it, you can make different decorative types of wire. And as you go down, we have uh, this strip is what we might call ribbon wire. And running down this way, we've got strip twisted wire. And down here, we can then take those wires and decorate those. What's happening down here is they're actually making beading to make it look like granulation, but in fact, it's a long wire that looks like a, a series of beads. The one thing I think that you should pay attention to is that once you finish with this strip twisted wire, you have diagonal lines on it like a candy cane. And that's distinctive of strip twisted wire. And here's some actual examples of some of those techniques. And you can see the candy cane lines on the top example. Now, here's some examples of beaded wire being made. You can either use a tool such as in the diagram or you can hammer it into a swage block, which is a block that has different uh, designs already in it in which you just hammer the soft gold into it and you get the design. And here are the Shilla earrings and you can see the beaded wire, which is running along this leaf shape right here. I'm not quite sure whether this was done in a swage block or whether they actually, they could have used a chisel and hammer also on a flat piece of wire. And here are some examples of wire work in the ancient world. In this Hellenistic earring, this area right about in here is blown up here in the scanning electron microscope image. So you can see we have a combination of wires making up this exquisite piece of jewelry. This is beaded wire, more beaded wire here. Um, here's some strip twisted wire and more larger beaded wire down there. Really exquisite material. And I have to say that the um, Egyptian, Greek, and Etruscans really are the, have done the most fantastic gold work when you look throughout the ancient world. Now, drawn wire. Fine wire can also be made today, or usually is made today, by drawing it through a piece of pierced metal with graded holes. And so you draw it through each hole, each one slightly smaller, until you finally get down to the size of wire you want. But it's also compressing the metal as well. So up on the upper left, the scanning electron microscope photograph shows you what modern drawn wire looks like. And you don't have those candy cane lines, diagonal lines. We have straight lines, very fine straight lines. And when you look at the gold earring on the right, you can see here that we also have these straight lines so that they were drawing wire in Schilla. And this is another example, another Schilla earring, a scanning electron microscope photograph of it. And that too is drawn wire. Now, the date of the first drawn wire is open to debate. The technique was not used in Europe until around 700 AD, and then it really didn't become widespread until the Middle Ages. We have here evidence that the draw plate was used in the Shilla kingdom. So did it first start in Shilla and then move westward? I think it's a very interesting question. Now let's take a look at chain making, because now that we have these nice wires, we can start to do something with them. But chain making involves the use of heat. So a wire is first formed, made into a loop, and then joined by heating, such that the, such that the loop is then fused together and makes a circle. If this was tied to a chain, the neighboring links would melt when you heated it up. So one way of avoiding the heat damage was to make a flexible chain by threading individual singly made circles together, in which we call it the loop-in-loop -loop chain. And you can see that it can be very complicated. These are two examples in the exhibition, but in the diagram you can see we have very simple chains to extremely complicated chains. 
And when we look across the ancient world, we see I've chosen some examples very, oops, come back here. Um, this is the simpler Roman chain here, simple loop and loop, and here we have a Greek chain that's more complicated. And we get down here to the Egyptian chain, and it's incredibly complicated. In fact, it even seems to be sewn together. Now, on the last technique, I want, well, no, it's not quite the last, but granulation is the next technique we're going to be looking at. It's really the most decorative of all the techniques. Etruscan goldsmiths in the 7th and 6th centuries BC in Italy really created the most exquisite granulation that has ever existed. The spheres of gold are smaller than the head of a modern pin. The fineness of their work has rarely been equaled since. And you can see an example in the middle top, top row. And then there are some other very fine examples from the one on the left, upper left is from Iran. And this is just a scanning electron microscope photograph to show you not only do you have the beads and how they're fused, but you also have small beads on top of beads. So it can get extremely elaborate. And then, of course, our wonderful um, Indian earrings in the Asian galleries are quite exquisite. So the granules can be made by cutting pieces of gold wire and melting them on a flat surface over a bed of charcoal. The surface tension causes the liquid gold to form perfect spheres. And once these have cooled, then they can be stuck down on a gold object with a paste of animal glue and copper salts. Then they're heated to the point that they fuse to the surface. And this technique, as you've seen, has been perfected by the Etruscans and the Greeks, but then it was lost for centuries afterwards. Later goldsmiths struggled to produce granulation, but they used solder instead of the copper salts and it's a much clumsier method. And here are some examples uh, where the goldsmith is putting the little bits of gold into the furnace and they're beginning to melt and form into spheres. And this can even be done with a blowpipe as you can see in the, slide, uh, the photo on the left where a goldsmith in Myanmar is making the bead at the bottom. And here's some examples, of course, of the beautiful granulation in the Schiller exhibition. Now, casting into a mold is another method of manufacturing that can be used for gold objects. However, it's rather wasteful of metal, as it much more is needed than you actually uh, end up in the finished object because you have to allow for shrinkage of the metal and also there, there are other losses. So where metal is expensive, there is uh, an, sort of a, an inception to uh, craft by hand rather than by casting. And just to try and explain simply, it, it can be rather complicated. We've seen the little gold Buddha on the bottom when we know it was cast of solid gold. And I, sh I should mention that the halo behind him is actually sheet gold that's been hammered and then chisel cut. But the Buddha itself probably started off as a wax model, which then they added these wax runners around it so they would get good metal flow to all parts of the image. Then they packed it with clay here they're melting out the wax, then they invert it and pour molten metal into it. And once it cools, you've got your figure, but you have to cut off all the excess runners. And then you have to do a lot of after work to finally come up with a fine, shiny surface. And here's a few examples of some other cast objects from the ancient world. But again, you have more hand-worked pieces rather than cast pieces, I think. And you can see that again and again in, in our galleries. Now, gilding was a method 
of applying a very thin layer of gold to the surface of an object, and it's a very economical method of producing an attractive gold finish. So what might look like solid gold is actually a bronze or copper or silver and covered with just a thin layer of gold. The earliest method of gilding metal was by mechanically attaching gold foils along um, grooves on the object. Or you could take a thicker gold sheet and wrap it around the object and again press it down because the gold was so soft. But after a while, when they had learned to refine gold to very high purity, they were able to hammer it into extremely thin sheets really into what we call uh, gold leaf today. And then you can use an adhesive or a resin to apply the gold leaf onto the surface of your metal or wooden objects or whatever. So the earliest methods, um, the, the, the other method would be mercury gilding, which is when you add mercury and gold together, it forms a liquid amalgam. And this can be applied to the silver or gold object. And then when it's heated, driving off the mercury, it leaves behind a gold layer, which then needs to be polished and burnished. And again, leaving a nice, beautiful gold surface. And I believe, although I haven't examined these in detail, I believe that these are uh, cast uh, copper alloy with a probably an amalgam gilding on the surface of them, but they're, they're quite fascinating. And since these were also imported, but we also have other um, images in the exhibition that do use mercury gilding. Some of the other uh, bronzes of the Buddhas have mercury gilding on them. So we know that technique had also come into Shilla. So, so far, We've seen all these incredible objects. I thought I would end with this just because it's such a good example, a good combination of all the techniques. We've got hammered sheet, we've got drawn wire, we've got chain work. Although we don't have real, true granulation, what we have, and if you go into the gallery and take a close look, look along the edge and what you'll see is imitation granulation, where they've actually just taken a tool and made pinpricks to make it look like granulation. So I think at this point, why don't I ask Jenna to please come on up and demonstrate a couple of these techniques. I think she's going to show us some, what do we say? We said we're going to, some wire, twisted wire, some chain making, and some granulation. Hi, I'm Jenna Wainwright. Um, thank you, Donna, for that introduction. And thank you, Denise and So Young, for inviting me to do this presentation. Um, first, we're going to start with a very simple decorative technique, um, twisting wire that's in this earring here, and you'll see it in some of the Sheila jewelry. And Jenna has made all of these, everything <laughs> she's showing you. Okay, so we're just going to start with a very thin piece of 22 karat gold wire. Um, I'm going to bend it in half. And we're just going to put the two ends in the vise to hold it. In fact, you could probably do it just with two hands the, you could. The, the ancients probably might not have had a vice. Yeah. <laughs> it's very simple. So we'll just keep twisting it until you get the desired visual effect. And all these techniques are, you know, to have a different play of light on the piece of jewelry. Granulation will give you a different visual effect than twisted wire, which will give you a different effect than chiseled wire. So it really depends on how you want your piece to glow. Are you and applying a lot of pressure on that, or is that fairly, no, it's really quite... No, not at all. It's yeah. very easy, and, you know, if you want it to be very tight spirals, just keep going. And that's twisting wire. Yeah. Very simple. 
That's how we ease into this demonstration. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to get a little more complicated and do loop and loop chain making, um, which you'll see in these two earrings and this chain. Um, we're going to make a chain like this long necklace. And that's a loop and loop chain. Right? Yes, that's a single loop and loop chain. Mm -hmm. um, the earrings are both double loop and loop chains, and you'll see they're, um, they're much finer. You're actually um, using twice as many loops. You're weaving from two different directions. Um, but we'll just do the single one today. So first you'll start with a piece of wire, and you want to make rings that are consistent size. So the way to make rings that are all almost exactly the same size, you'll wrap it around a dowel and make a coil. And we'll use the vise for this too, although it's not necessary. Just does another hand. And you want to wrap it with a consistent amount of pressure so your rings come out to be the same size. Is that straight, or are you going at a diagonal, or? I'm just going on a diagonal to mm -hmm. let the camera catch up. There we go. <laughs> no, that's interesting, because yeah. I've seen some of the Korean links that are actually cut at an angle. Instead mm -hmm. of a blunt cut, they tend to be cut at an angle. Oh. I guess if, if you did it that way, you would have more surface area joining. Maybe that's the reason. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. So. And we'll just remove this from the dowel. And the wonderful thing about gold is if you have any excess, you never really have excess because you can always melt it down and make something out of it later. So I'm just going to cut through this coil. I don't hear it crying. <laughs> <laughs> so we have three loops and a little extra. Um, so right now I'm just going to explain the difference between soldering and fusing. Um, now that you have these three loops, there are two ways you could close this gap. Um, you could solder it, and soldering it would mean you would introduce another material at the seam another material that has a lower melting point than the gold that you're using. Um, so as you heat it, that point will melt faster than the rest of the ring. So say you're using 22 karat gold, which this is, um, you could use a very tiny snippet of <coughs> 14 karat gold, which has a lower melting point because of the addition of, a greater addition of silver and copper, um, because those two elements have a lower melting point. Um, so you could put this piece of 14 karat or 18 karat gold right in that seam and heat it until that melts and then you have a closed circle. Um, so for instance, if you were making a chain by just putting these together, like so, Then you would go through and you would solder this point and then you would expose this seam and then you would solder that point and then you would expose the third seam and then you would solder that point. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to fuse the gold. So we're not introducing a new material. And what we'll do is heat this ring just to the point where the whole ring melts, just barely. And then it closes that seam by itself. Um, which is a technique you couldn't do if you were making a chain like this, because if you melted that to that point, it would melt to the next ring, and you wouldn't have a loose chain anymore. Now, remember, gold has such good thermal properties that the heat would travel very quickly. Mm -hmm. So right now, I'm just going to butt these seams so they're perfectly matched.
And what I'm doing is I'm just adding a little tension by bending them and overlapping the seam a few times. So there's a little spring tension that holds it closed. That way I know that the two ends are touching. And you want to line it up as perfectly as possible so your ring doesn't have an imperfection at that point. How small do you think you could make these rings if you had to? Hmm. <laughs> um, you could make a ring certainly out of um, this smaller gauge wire. You could go, I think you could go down to a millimeter fairly uh -huh. easily. You could wrap it around a needle and have a coil hmm. the size of a needle. Okay, so now we have our three rings. And we're just going to heat these up until they fuse. And what are you using <coughs> to heat? Um, so I'm using just a little handheld butane torch. Um, this is the travel torch. You can also use acetylene. Um, and in ancient times, they probably would have done this in a kiln or with a blowpipe, um, any sort of direct flame onto that spot. Because you really need a lot of control. You want to heat the whole ring, but really focus the heat right at the seam and make sure it flows there. Okay. Does it change color? How do you know it when it's done? So it'll get bright red, and then you'll, you'll actually see, see it flow. And if I'm not fast enough removing the flame, then it will be completely malformed. <laughs> <laughs> so it takes practice. It takes a little practice. And it's not you, something might, you might see one <laughs> become very wrinkled. So you probably see. shouldn't do this in your kitchen. No. <laughs> it's getting there. You can see it just starts to really glow. All right. I think that one went. Cools off very quickly, doesn't it? Yes. And the reason I'm doing this over a charcoal block is the charcoal helps to keep the atmosphere clean, um, so you don't get as many um, imperfections just appearing on the metal, which you could clean off, but it's just easier to prevent the oxidation. I see the charcoal is tied together. Is there a reason for that? Um, so the charcoal is tied together because the charcoal will start to crack apart. Be because the more of the you heat? Use, or, yeah. Mm -hmm. The more you use the block. If you keep, keep it tied together, you can use the block many more times. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I believe all of those are fused, but we'll know for sure when I start manipulating them. And I'm just going to dip these to clean them a little bit. Yeah, they're, they're quite uh, black. They look quite dark. We've yeah. kind of lost that golden color. So you've got some sort of oxide on there, or sulfide. Yeah, um, because it's 22 karat gold, it's not pure gold, so you will mm -hmm. see a little oxidation. And so you're just dipping it in a, an acid bath to just clean, to clean off, the, off the oxides? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So now I have here the different stages of making links for a loop and loop chain. Um, so we'll start with this complete circle and we'll take a pair of round pliers and spread it out into an oval. And just use our pliers backwards. And I can see my seam didn't split, so that was successfully fused. <laughs> it's always nice to see. And then after we have this um, oval, then we're going to pinch the center. And then once you pinch the center, you need to pinch just one end of your figure eight because that end will be the end that you start weaving. You just want to make it skinny enough that it will be able to fit through the last link. And then we'll fold it up into a U. And if you can imagine, making a chain such as the one seen here is about 200 links. And one that would be a double loop and loop chain would be more like 500 or 700 links. That's a lot of little <laughs> loops. It's a lot of loops. <laughs> um, and OK, so we'll just do a couple of these, and then we'll start weaving them together. Well, it's really quite a time-consuming job. It is. It's quite therapeutic. You can just do this for hours. <laughs> okay. And the gold is much easier to work with than, say, silver or copper? Yes. Um, 22 karat gold is much easier to work with than um, sterling silver, but fine silver and 22 karat gold are pretty mm -hmm. similar in the malleability. And so the, the chain seen here is actually in fine silver. Okay, so now that we have a few links, I'm going to heat them up again because now that I've done so much manipulation with the gold, it's work hardened, and so I won't have an easy time of trying to weave it at this point. So I'm just going to heat them up again so they're a little bit softer. And I'll just heat them up until they glow red, not enough to melt, just enough to. So what you're really doing is relaxing the metal grains so that they'll go back down to where they were originally. Otherwise, it might crack be very brittle. And another reason you wouldn't solder links for a chain like this is if you had a solder point, that point on this link would just be slightly harder than the rest of the link. So as you're doing all these curves, you would have one point that would be a little more stubborn when trying to weave the chain. Okay, so I'm just going to start with a link that I didn't flatten one end. Okay. And I'm going to put this in the vise so we can keep spreading each link so it's the same diameter. Okay, so we have our first link. Just going to make sure the two openings are nice and round. Okay. And we're 
we're just going to fold these over into the shape that we need, a nice closed loop. So this is what a single loop looks like in the chain without any weaving. Okay, so now we'll start weaving. So we have a link that has one smaller end and one larger end. So we're going to take the smaller end and just push it through the previous link. And once it's pushed through, you bend the top third over to meet itself. And then you'll open up the smaller end so it's even. And there you have two links. And we'll just throw one more in there. I think I have a new appreciation for chains. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there's the begin beginning of your chain. Now once you form your whole chain, um, you'll want to make sure that every link has exactly the same um, diameter openings. So that way you have a nice flexible chain that moves when you're wearing it. Um, and the way to do that is, once you're finished weaving them all together, then you go to your scribe again, and you press it over all four openings, just to make sure it's perfectly even. And you just go down your chain, and you do that over and over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> this is a repetitive business <laughs> you're in. Very repetitive. <laughs> And if you feel that the gold is work hardened again, then you would go back and you can anneal the whole chain once it's woven together and just be very careful not to melt one section because then you would have to start over. <laughs> so in fact, if somebody's been wearing the same chain for many, many, many years, would it benefit from being heated? Um, I don't think wearing it wouldn't have mm -hmm. enough stress on it, I don't believe. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So there you go. That is loop and loop chain making. So now we're going to get to granulation. Um, so there are a few examples here of granulation. Um, and one of these is actually the piece that was made in the video that's in the Sheila exhibition. So you can see um, some more example, examples of granulation there. So we're going to start with a few pieces of wire to make our granules. You could start with wire or you could start with very thin gold sheet and cut tiny little squares out of your gold sheet. Um, I'm just going to snip these wires. This is also very time consuming. <laughs> but meditative. <laughs> meditative. <laughs> uh -huh. So it's, now it's we have all of these tiny little snips of wire. They're, they're really hard to see. They're really tiny. Can you see them on the screen a little bit? OK. OK, we're just going to spread them out because I want them all to melt individually and not melt into each other and make one large ball. So depending on the size of what you've cut off the, will be the size of the bead. So you could make mm -hmm. really big beads if you had cut up a big piece mm -hmm. and tiny beads with the, the small ones. Okay, so there we have a range of beads. I'm just going to set this aside. And now we'll make the granules. 
And you can see on this charcoal block that there is a little, a little um, channel dug out of the edge, and that's just so once the granules are formed, they don't go rolling off the edge. Sometimes just the air from the torch will push them enough to do that. Yeah, you need to be out of a breeze, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay. You can see they'll start, <laughs> they just have a little life of their own. Literally, literally jumps. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take much time, does it? No. But you can see how you can do this with any, you know, a small sheet of gold, um, gold that you've panned out of the river. There's right. any tiny piece. You, it naturally wants to ball up when you heat it to melting point. And again, this is 22 karat gold you're using? This is 22. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there we have enough granules. So are you going to have to put those in the acid as well? No, they're, they should be clean enough mm -hmm. from the charcoal that they can just stay. Okay, so now I've made a mixture of water, fish glue, and copper salts. Um, it could be fish glue or you could use hide glue, any natural carbon containing glue. Okay. Just like the ancients. <laughs> so I'm going to dip a granule into this solution And basically what those things do, those components do, the glue holds the bead where you want it on your workpiece. So it doesn't go flying all around when you're applying heat. And the copper salts lower the melting point just ever so slightly at the point of contact between your beads and your substrate, which helps the granulation process. Okay, so I have three little granules there. And first I'm just going to just very lightly heat the piece so the water burns off, and so then the pieces will just be held by the glue. If you went too fast and just put the flame directly on it, they would just fly all over the place. So, just gonna, oh, oh, and they did. It was not gentle enough. So, so. in fact, Sometimes you would set it aside and let it just dry on its own, yeah, and and then come that back would be to it. <laughs> yeah, safer. Right. right, but you're you're under the gun here. Yeah, <laughs> not here. And I wonder if they put it in a, a muffle furnace as well. One that would drive off the water. Mm-hmm. Okay, and there you see it's starting to blacken and you know your glue is drying. That is the telltale sign. So. Drying and probably burning off as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I know my pieces aren't going to move around anymore. So now I can go in and as the chain making, I'm just going to heat it just to fusing temperature. So you'll actually see the substrate will start to shimmer and the surface will be just ever so slightly melting along with the surface of the beads. And for this reason, when you're doing granulation, the substrate has to be 
thinner than the beads that you're applying to it because you want them to be melting at the same time. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. And does the substrate have to be the same composition as the beads? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And again, you're looking at color to tell you when mm -hmm. it's when it's getting close, and then mm -hmm. you'll see the shimmer. You'll see when it actually starts to melt. There, it's starting there. And if you went too far, the beads would just become little flat pancakes. Right. <laughs> if you went too far, then the edges would curl up, and you would have one big ball. Ah. Uh, okay. <laughs> Um, actually, you can see, why don't I just move this over to the other spot. You can see on this one, this is a piece that I had done previously, and you can see I went a little too far, and the surface is actually um, very sparkly and mottled because it just melted more than it should have. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's clean this up. And now, do you have to clean that off as well? Yeah, I'm just going to clean it off so it, so you can see the gold. So I can imagine making some of those beads in the Schiller exhibit a huge amount of time and terrifying to get the beads right <laughs> on the front side yes, and the back side is. and the middle. And <laughs> Uh, again, a new appreciation for mm -hmm. that gold work. And so again, the benefit of fusing rather than soldering in a case like this, if, if you were just adding three beads to this piece, you could easily solder that. You could put three beads down, put the solder next to it, and the solder would flow into those seams. Um, but it, then if you wanted to add more granules, you'd be in trouble because if you heated it up again, that solder would flow before the next piece, and you would have solder all over the place, and your pieces would move around. So this is why you want to do fusing when you're doing granulation on a larger scale. So for this more complicated piece, um, first I fused a wire down the center, and then I went in, placed all the granules, and fused those. And of course, I'm not very good at granulation, so some of them didn't quite fuse. Um, so maybe three or four didn't fuse on that try, but then I can just go back, place them, let the glue burn off, and fuse those granules. And I can keep doing that over and over again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so that's thank it. you very much, Jenna. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I hope that our talks and demonstration have given you a little more insight and then you go back and look at the Schiller gold and take a look at some of those techniques and see if you can find them. Thank you.